So welcome to the third week uh, of uh, parametric engineering. Um, as said, I'm, my name is Vincenzo Reale and I work as structural engineer at Arup. I also briefly worked before Arup uh, at Dadid Architects for a year or so and I'm also uh, working for Anthony Gormley, the sculpture as computational designer. Um, I usually start um, this uh, week lecture by talking about uh, um, a project which is not a new project, it's actually a pretty old project now, uh, which is the Sydney Opera House, because um, sometimes when we talk about uh, parametric tools, we um, tend to um, see them as an innovation in design. But I would like to stress that uh, um, the design process is not completely new and that uh, the techniques that we use today, although the techniques are different, they still follow um, um, ideas and way to progress into the design of, um, of a building that are uh, potentially very old. And that the, the, to me is always important to stress that the tool itself is not so important. I mean, it's important to master as much tools as, as you can but the idea behind that driving the process of the design is always the most important part uh, in the design process. So you may or may not know that the Sydney Opera House was designed in the 50s and the architect was the Danish architect Hudson, um, which won the competition, um, which was um, defined at the time, with this drawing. And... Um, when he won the competition, he came to Ove Arup, which was a, a still young engineer at the time. He was Danish as well, although he had uh, opened an office in, in the UK. And he asked for uh, the help of Arup in order to realize this idea. So this, his idea was to have this sort of shells, and in his mind, these surfaces would have worked as shells. Um, so what did Arup do? And this is possibly the signature uh, project that defined the, the office where I worked in and, and made it really famous. So the first thing that the engineers at Arup and Arup itself did was to use the latest technologies that were available at the time, uh, which were on one hand um, really complex physical simulations and we also had a giant computer in our office in London. So we um, tried to compute uh, the performances of these shells and uh, after many many iterations um, what the engineers realized was that uh, these shells didn't work as shells so the, the, t the curvature was too tight and so basically the sketch and the design that um, Hudson had defined didn't really work so what happened is that uh, one engineer which was in the team had this idea uh, he had the idea to change uh, slightly the design, so to keep the idea of the original design, but to he had an idea on how to rationalize, how to make it possible. And he thought, oh, well, if instead of using this freeform surface, we um, take, uh, for example, alpha sphere and we start cutting pieces out from this sphere, we can actually make uh, um, a building which is much, much more efficient than the one which was designed in the first place. On one end, because uh, the curvature was, was constant. On the other, because you can think of that all the elements which are um, at the same uh, height within the um, hemisphere, they are actually the same piece. So there is potentially some uh, um, space for uh, standardization of the pieces. And this is what actually happened. In the end, uh, the, the, um, the Sydney Opera House didn't work as a shell, it worked with a series of trusses, but the, the pieces of these trusses were actually um, made, pre were precast elements which were made at the base of the, of the Sydney Opera House, and, uh, and you can actually read from this image before the cladding was uh, put on that they're actually the same piece, it's just arrayed at a different uh, level, so you have a series of pieces which are exactly the same, so you can use the same mold to actually create them. And now you, you, it's more difficult to read, but if you look at the Sydney Opera House and you didn't know, you possibly didn't understand that the geometry behind was actually a pure sphere. Why am I saying this? Uh, I'm, I'm saying this because in this process, the most important part uh, was possibly when uh, 
the engineer had the idea to alter the design, introducing a sort of um, uh, parameterization, we can call it, or like a way to standardize the geometry, but keeping the original idea intact. So I think this is something that is challenging all, always nowadays as well, that we, we are pushed to do things which are really complicated, but in the end, if we try to find a, a rule or um, um, something guiding our process, then the geometry and the design comes much, much more easy. Uh, and this is the reason why Grasshopper, which is sort of uh, computational uh, design software and allows us to embed rules into the design, is a very powerful software because it actually, if we have the idea, which is the most important bit of the process, then we can codify that idea and we can apply it to a real project. So I wanted to show you also in parallel an example of a project I actually um, worked with. Um, so this project is within the new Abu Dhabi airport, which is currently under construction, and it's possibly the biggest construction site which has ever built. You can imagine this is a, a small part of one of the terminal, and it's already bigger than Heathrow. And within this space, um, we uh, were in contact with these architects, which are called Carpenter, Carpenter and Lowings, and they had the idea to they, they had to generate a device to connect different parts of the of the airport. There was a huge slab connecting the departure and the arrivals and they had to create a hole between the two slabs to create, to let the air and the light flow. And they had, and they had, they had the idea of uh, um, something that would resemble like a droplets of water just after touching uh, the surface of the liquid. So to begin with, we, we, had, we did a lot of sketches and we came up with this idea of uh, a sort of tensegrity structure. So you can see it on the right side. And this was analyzed with the software that we have in house at Arrow, which is called GSA, General Structural Analysis. And this piece of software basically, um, I mean, this was a really simple model. And um, in this model, you can see that there is like an internal strut and then there is a net of, uh, of cables, which is um, basically pre-stressing the, the internal struts. So blue ones are the, one, the elements in tension and the red one are the elements in compression, and everything was supposed to hang from uh, the hole in the slab, which is massive. So you have to imagine this is uh, 25 meters by 20 meters or so, or so, and everything was supposed to be clad. So what we can do with our software in Arup is uh, a process which is called form finding. So if you assign some elements and you assign a property, for example, you tell them that they are, they are cables and you assign some elasticity to this element, you can then apply a uniform or non-uniform stretch to this element and you can see which forms, which shapes, which shapes come from this process. Of course, by altering different parameters, you get different configuration, but also by altering the initial configuration, you get different results. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can do it. There is a plugin for um, Grasshopper that you will um, study in the next few weeks, which is called Kangaroo, which allows you to do this sort of standard relaxation algorithm. But basically, what they are doing is this: is just assigning uh, properties to um, uh, springs, and these springs tends to deform under the forces or under a strain that is assigned to each one of them. So while this process, while this um, this part of the process in this project was done through GSA, uh, the problem was that I had to uh, sorry, trying to go to the next slide. For some reason, I can't. with me a second. So while, while that part was done in, um, in GSA because I needed the forces as well and in Kangaroo it's difficult to get the forces, the problem was that the architect and all the other consultants were changing the design like on a daily basis. So I had to run this form finding on a shape which was constantly changing. And it was, I mean, you can imagine if you had to actually draw yourself this shape 
uh, every day two or three times, it might take a lot of time. While if you know the, the, the rule behind the generation of this shape and you just want to change some inputs, you can, for example, as I did in this grasshopper definition, you can use the sliders that you have already seen in la last week and by changing this parameter and by embedding the logic into a grasshopper definition you can get multiple, like an infinite number of shapes that then you can test with the stru structural software. And this is basically what I did. And you can see we went from a type of shape to a completely different one in terms of dimension and sizes of the element, but this was um, sped up I mean, the speed of the process was increased by a lot through the use of Grasshopper. And thanks to that, we could do also other analysis. We could do some post-processing. So the data were coming from tables, for example, and through Grasshopper I was um, assigning the, the values to the different parts of the geometry. And I could visualize, for example, the deflections or if uh, um, there were strict rules on, on the cladding panel. So um, the problem was to verify if this was acceptable or not, and through Grasshopper I could actually visualize it, which is not something you can always do with the structural software. And in the end, you can see this were like the, the model that we built, and recently, I'm just gonna make it smaller, and recently it has actually been finished, it's almost finished uh, on site. And it's quite rewarding to see something that you have developed through uh, grasshopper or like parametric techniques actually being built so it makes you think it's not just um, impossible geometries but they can actually be built and using these parametric tools helps you a lot in terms of construction so these sort of things would, would have been much much more difficult design in a different way So, going back to Rhino and Grasshopper, there are a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. You probably um, did already some geometry manipulation. I saw the exercises you did last week. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of background because you might not be um, so familiar with Rhino when you started this course on uh, what type of geometry we um, work with when we work uh, in Rhino. So Rhino is basically called a NURBS uh, modeler um, because it, it works with NURBS geometry. NURBS uh, means non-uniform rational B splines and they are a type of geometry which were developed uh, in the around the 1950s, 1960 um, from engineers which were working for example in the um, car industry because they wanted to describe curved and freeform surfaces. So mo all the geometries that you use in Rhino apart from meshes, so in general curves and surfaces, have embedded um, as a logic this sort of equation. So these equations are uh, formula that allow your computer to compute uh, the, um, uh, the different shapes and different surfaces. and. Uh, um, to visualize them. So if, if you zoom in in Rhino onto a surface, it never loses its resolution because the computer is constantly updating this equation. And this equation, NURBS, for NURBS curves and NURBS surfaces, um, they have different properties. One property which is really important, and we possibly will see today, is that they have control points. So the surface is not defined by points on the surface, but it's defined by points which are actually um, putting some forces of attraction onto the, the surface that you are modeling. And depending on the degree of the curve or the surface that you are looking at, they uh, have more or less power of attraction. And therefore, for example, if you reduce the attraction of each one of these points, you get smoother or like uh, more, um, like say, more relaxed surfaces. So you can imagine that uh, a curve degree one is actually a polyline, so a line going actually through points with kinks at every connection, while if, if you increase the degree of the curve, the points that you have defined 
gets farther and farther from the curve itself, which becomes in turn much, much smoother. So you see this is the Citroen DS, which was developed by Citroen in the 55, and uh, he was uh, using uh, this sort of equation in order to model the car. And uh, you can imagine that at the beginning, this uh, the need for this sort of freeform surface was limited to different industry from architecture. But from the 80s and 90s, the, the, the need to make use of, uh, of these geometries also in architecture became bigger and bigger, and therefore tools like grasshopper were more and more used by architects and engineers. So one of the first examples where Rhino was used was, for example, the Chanel pa Pavilion uh, by Zaha did, and this project was actually then engineered by Arup. This didn't use grasshopper at the time, it just used Rhino, but the idea was that in order to describe this curve, you need something which was similar to the software that were used in order to make ships or cars. And in this case, it was actually Rhino. And this was a demountable pavilion. It was designed by Radid and Arup. This is another project, a more recent one that um, we developed in my group uh, quite recently. It's a Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies. And again, these freeform surfaces where first of all they were designed with software like Rhino. I mean, it was actually designed in Rhino and also after the architect has developed the geometry in Rhino, uh, we were given by the shells and the different surfaces defining um, this building and we rationalized it through Grasshopper and we defined all the inner structure, all the trusses of the building where we're using as an input a geometry coming from Rhino and developed in Grasshopper. So this is what I was trying to tell you before. You can see on the upper left corner, you have a curve degree one, and if you increase the degree of a curve, it becomes smoother and smoother. It's still controlled by the same control points, but it's far and far from, from them. These are other properties, for example, tangency of a curve uh, depends on how many control points are aligned, and also on the degree of the curve. So a curve degree one, you just need two control points aligned. If you have a curve degree two, you need at least three control points aligned in order to get tangency. And one last thing about uh, NERMS is that both curves and surfaces, even if you see them as uh, uh, closed, even if you see a sphere or a cylinder, in reality you have to think of them always in terms of a rectangular patch we, which has been wrapped around the shape. It, because it's a mathematical um, definition, it has a domain, a start and an end of the domain in its, in its uh, uh, representation, and so even geometry which looks like closed geometry, in reality they are never closed. It's always a rectangular patch which has been wrapped around the shape. So even if you have a sphere, when you zoom in really closely to the top of the sphere, you, you would be able to see a really small hole. This doesn't really influence us because for our purposes that might be so small that you cannot actually perceive it or you're not influencing your design. But you need to be aware there are some properties, for example, when you are tessellating a surface that relies on this uh, uh, surface being always a rectangular patch. And as uh, you have in three dimension, every, every, every point in three dimension can be defined with three coordinates. When you are on a surface, you just need two coordinates. When you are on a curve, you just need one coordinate in order to find one point. Now, the first exercise that I wanted to do with you tonight is uh, this sort of uh, stadium roof. Um, so the way I mean, the way I usually approach um, a problem with Rhino of Grasshopper is sketching or looking at what I want to achieve. So, for example, if you look at this shape, the first thing you, you should think, and what we want to model tonight is um, the roof of, the, of this part, so the, the one which is uh, curved. How would you um, start uh, developing this shape? What are the inputs that you need in order to develop this shape? What do you want to model yourself and what do you want to let the software or grasshopper develop based on your input? 
So if, if you look at this one, can, can you tell me what you think the inputs could be? Can somebody of you point me at, at uh, an input that could be needed in order to define this shape? Yeah, that, that could be one possibility. So we need some setup. Uh, let's say if we already have add this part here, or if we just wanted to do this roof and the rest is modeled, what would we need in order to, to generate the roof? Yeah, you can just, sorry? Yeah, we, we might do these arches, but these arches are revolving around yeah, the, the, the edge curves. So for example, the edge curves could be an input. So instead of defining the edge curves in um, Grasshopper, I could define the edge curves in, um, in Rhino and then build the arches. And when I build the arches, what are the parameters that I might need? Yeah, so how many, the number of the arches, and what else? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So, how, how, what, what's the height of the arches? And basically, here you can see that we can think of the shape as two sets of arches, some which are high and some which are low. So, what the maximum height and what the lowest height of the arches, like of the two sets. So, what we said is the inputs could be the boundary curves, number of arches, and the height of the points. So, let's try to to make this into a grasshopper definition. So if you open Rhino, um, let's, let's draw, first of all, these input curves, okay? So a way we can do that is if you, let, let's do an ellipse to start with. So if you just type ellipse, or you find in the toolbar, it should be this one. You can just type the center at zero, 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 it doesn't matter. And then we define two axes. Okay, and then when you add this, you you could start uh, a bit uh, manipulating your original geometry. One thing you can do is you can turn on the gamble, and this allows you to, to for example, if, if you click on those uh, uh, squares here, you can actually manipulate the scale of your ellipse. Right? So when you are happy with that, what you can do is, if you keep Alt press and you deform your geometry, so you move again one of those little squares, you can actually create a copy of that ellipse. So I did it. You just need to do it once. So I just go back and show it to you again. You select the ellipse and then you keep Alt pressed, and then you modify one of the parameter. You release the mouse button and you get a different curve okay which is a copy and it's quite important now that you actually do a copy and I will show you in a little while so we have these two curves okay now they are planar might be not very interesting what we can do and we should always look back at your at our sketch so for example in here I have moved the points so that this curve is not planar anymore so one way you can do that is by turning the control points of your curve on and you can turn the control points with this icon or just type in points on or I think is also okay I think it's F10 for the moment I'm not gonna press it but you can control the control points so what you can do is you can for example grab two of these control points bring them up And then these are the two. And you see that it doesn't look very nice. It's a bit kinky, 
in here and in this position. This is because, I mean, first of all, what you can see is that I'm using control points. Um, secondly, what you, we can see that when you build an ellipse in Rhino is actually, um, this ellipse is actually a series of arches. So it's not just a nerves curve, a continuous nerve curve. But first of all, you can see that I'm using control points to modify it. If I want to get rid of these points, uh, of these kinks, first of all, you need to press escape in order to remove the control points. Then I would select both curves because we need to do the same for the other. And I would type rebuild. So what rebuild is doing is changing the degree and the number of point of control point of the curve. So and it's also telling you what was the degree before. So it had eight control points and two and the degree was two, but in reality it was a set of arches. So I would keep the degree to two and Sorry, let's move the degree to three. And let's still put eight control points. So in order to move up the points, you need to select your curve, turn the control points on by writing points on or clicking on this icon. And then you would see the control point. The way I'm moving them is I'm just selecting a few of these points and then I'm using the gamble. You could also use the command move and just move them on the dead. Right. And then I'm going to do the same for the inner one. I mean, you can do it as much as you like, and you can define the shape that you want. What, what is important at this point is that, for example, you didn't... Um, I mean, first of all, you rebuild the, both the curves, and one curve is a copy of the other, because I want them to match quite closely in terms of how they were initially defined. Okay, then you can play with it after, but the important is that you get these two input curves. You all get it? Now let's say this is what you get from uh, uh, an architect or somebody wants you to develop the geometry. So this is your input. We want to bring this input, we want to reference this input into Grasshopper. How do we reference it? You should have seen it before in the previous lesson. What you should have seen is that there are a few components which are components usually defined with a black hexagon around them. And these components are actually containers. So they're not doing anything. There's no any operation that Grasshopper is doing on them. But they are used to store a geometry. And this geometry can come from Rhino. So you can reference a geometry from Rhino into Grasshopper. And then you can play with that. So in order to reference, this, this, these two curves are curves. So the geometry type is a curve. So in order to reference them, you need to go into parameters, geometry, and get two curves component. You can get one, and then you can, if you, if you want, you can copy and paste it. And what you can do in order to reference them is to click on one of these components right click on it, set one curve, and then click on the curve you want to reference. Then we, we are going to do it again for the outer curve. I'm going to click on right click on the component, set one curve, and I'm setting the outer edge. And you see that they are referenced, uh, therefore they become uh, red in, grass, in Rhino if they are not selected, when they become green 
if I select them. So this means that the curves which are in Rhino have been referenced into Grasshopper. If you need help in order to define these curves, at the beginning just raise your hand and both Catherine and Giovanni and Andrew are going to help you. Can quickly show it also on the side again. So what I did was I defined an ellipse. I selected it and I created a copy of this ellipse by keeping Alt press and altering one of the scale handles. Then I scaled the inner one again. What I did is I selected both curves, I rebuilt them. So with the command rebuild, and I used, uh, and you can use the same, I use 8 and 3 as parameters. And then I use the command points on in order to play with the control points of my curves. And then you need to press escape in order to turn the control points, which are those handles we were talking about when we were defining, when we were talking about NURBS curves. Now, if you manage to get the curves and to reference them into Grasshopper, what you should always do is to uh, leave some references and some notes for everybody who is actually using your definition. So it might not be you, it might be a colleague of yours, or it might be you in a month time, and you are going to open this definition and you want to know how it works. So it's always important, it's very important, to put as much in, as in, information as possible within the definition. What I usually do is I try to label my components. One way to label a component is to select one component and press Control G to group it, or you can also select the component, right click, uh, sorry, middle mouse button and this green icon which is group, or you can also go into edit and group. When you do that, uh, around the component you see that the shape is going to come and this is a group. You can group multiple objects in one of these shapes, but what I do is usually I group one object just with itself. So I can put a tag to this group which is going to follow the object. The way to put the tag is uh, by clicking on this uh, rectangle that has uh, appeared, right clicking onto this rectangle, you're going you're gonna to get this um, label where you can actually type. So I'm going to call this inner curve. And then I'm going to do the same with the other component. I'm going to label it outer curve. Now, these are my inputs. Uh, we said we possibly add another few inputs. One was, we called it number of arches. I guess it's going to be an integer number, so how many arches? It could be, I don't know, 10, 20, 25. So I know it's a defined number of elements, and an integer number meaning there's no floating point. They can't, I can't have 5.5 arches. It's either 5 arches or 6 arches. So I know it's an integer. Uh, you probably have seen that you can actually input um, data into Grasshopper, values into Grasshopper by using a slider. And the slider is usually an input number slider. However, there is also a shortcut to get these sliders, which is quite useful. So a way to get a slider going from one number to another in Grasshopper is by double clicking on the canvas, typing the first number of the slider, the lowest number of the slider, for example, let's say five, and then dot dot 30 
for example, if I want a slider, an integer slider going from 5 to 30. So double click on the canvas, in my case 5.30, I get a slider, which is integer because I didn't put 5.0, going from 5 to 30. And I can call this, I can, I can tag this, give to this a name as well, by right clicking on the component and just calling it um, number of arches. You just need to right click onto the gray area. Now, we said that there were other inputs and the other inputs could be the different eyes of our arches. Uh, for the moment, I'm just going to put two sliders and I, I can make one uh, equal to, I don't know, 25 meters and one uh, equal to 10 meters. Just two numbers. But I know that these can be floating point numbers because the height could be 5.5 meters. So I'm going to use the same strategy to put the slider. I'm going to double click on the canvas and I'm going to write 5.5 dot dot... Uh, 20. And I call this uh, height 1. And then what I can do is I can just copy and paste this slider and I call it height 2. I move it a bit. So even before starting connecting different components, I have clear in my mind which ones are the inputs. Now, I need to define a workflow. I need to define a strategy in order to get the surface that I sketched or I, I saw in an image and I want to recreate. What do you think I should do? Where, where do you think I should start from? What can I do with these curves in order to generate these arches? Yeah? Well, if you were to sketch this, how would you do it? Yeah, that's a possibility. Actually, it's possibly what you're going to do. Yes. Yeah, so I know that I want a certain number of arches, so I know that these arches will start from one curve and end to the other curve. So what I can do is I can start subdividing these curves into many parts and then connecting the subdivisions. And then eventually I need to, instead of a straight line connecting these points, I need to actually raise these lines to create arches. So I think you have seen it already in the curve um, set of components under divisions there is a component which is called divide curve so it's under curve division so I want you to bring this in and actually I want you to bring two of this in so by default if we plug a curve into the C you're gonna get 10 segments, so 11 points. So let's bring our inner curve into this division and you see that we get some points. And then we do the same for the outer curve. Now, uh, the number of subdivision should actually be the number of arches. So let's do that. Let's connect number of arches both to one and the other. Let's see if it's true. I actually have 19 points. If this was a straight line, like a known closed curve, I would get uh, 20 points. Well, because the start point ends with the, with, it's, it's in the same position as the end point. I actually get 19 points, even if this is the number of subdivisions, number of segments. 
So it's good to know, it's always good to check. The way I checked it was just by hovering above the P and you can see 19 defined values. Now, the simplest way, as some of you said, is just by co connecting these points with line and loft them. Loft means generating a nerve surface through the interpolation of a set of curves. So we can do that in the first instance and see the result. We won't have arches, we won't have sort of ruled surface because it's going through segments. So first of all, I need to define these lines and I think you have seen this already as well. If you go under curve primitives, there is a component which is called line. And it's actually required two points, a start point and an end point. So let's just connect the points from the first curve and the point from the second curve. <coughs> and now we see also something which is really important when we talk about lists and how the data are organized. What we see is that if in display you have draw icons and draw fancy wires on, which is usually what we suggest you should do, so in display to turn on draw icons and to draw on fancy wires, you get some visual hints about what's happening in your canvas. And the hint that we're getting this time is while this wire connecting my inner curve to my divide curve component is just a straight, simple line, the wire connecting my points to my segments, it's a double line. And being a double line, it means that what I'm streaming from this component to this component is not just a single element, it's not a single piece of data, but multiple elements. Because it's a continuum, continuous, uh, double line, it means this element, they don't have any hierarchy. They are what we call, and you will see that um, probably in the following um, classes, they're called uh, flat lists. So they're flat and there's no hierarchy. All the elements are just in a single list and they're not subdivided. They're not take, the subdivision is not, um, the elements are not subdivided in any way. There's no order. I mean, there's just an order, but there are no clusters of data. But if you have fancy wires on, you will be able to see this. Now, if I change the number of subdivision, you see that the number of arches is changing. What we could do at this point is we could loft these curves. Uh, as I told you before, loft is a way to generate a surface through a set of curves. Um, this command is in surface free form, and it's called loft. So if you drag that into the canvas, you will see when you connect your line to your loft, is that we have generated a surface. Although this surface is not complete, because there are some options in loft, and if you just give to him a set of curves, it's going to start from the first curve and stop to the last one. But you can tell him to create a closed loft. The way you create a closed loft is by right-clicking on the options, on the O in the loft, and in loft option, you click on closed loft, and then commit changes. And you see that your surface is continuous. Now, there are no arches, the surface is not flat because uh, the way I define my original curves and bear in mind that you can always switch from this set of curves to another set of curves or you can alter a bit these curves and the geometry will follow and this is a potential of using a parametric approach to design. We can change the number of arches but still we can't do what I wanted to do in the first place, so I don't really have the arches, I just have lines. How can we actually generate these arches? What do you think we should do? <laughs> what, what, what are we missing? Yeah, it, it, arches can be defined by three points. It's likely, at the moment, we, we have two of these points. We, we are missing the third one. We are, in, we are missing the apex of our arch. 
How do you think we can do it? We could find a point on this curve and then just move it up. That's one possibility. Of course, we could look at the normal of the surface at that point, but one simple possibility would be to define a third point, which could be in the middle, but could be also somewhere else along these lines, and then just move it up and then create through these two points and that point an arch. Now, how do I define a point on a curve? There are different ways to do that. And if I had to, if I didn't know where to find it, I would try to guess where to find a component that operates on curves. Uh, and so I would think possibly it's gonna be under the curve label. And into the analysis, I would find a component which is called point on curve. So, if you bring this point on curve component into the canvas, you see it's a slider itself. By default, it's at 0.5, which means that it's giving you a point which is in the middle of the domain of that curve. Remember that the domain of the curve is not uh, the length of the curve. So, these are nerves curves, so they are defined by angles, so the domain depends also on many angles you have. You could have many angles at the beginning and then just two angles and then the middle would be more unbalanced towards the beginning. So this is a way that you link um, the definition of points on a curve to their uh, mathematical domain, let's say. In this case, these are straight lines. There are no many co not many contour points. So point 0.5, I would expect, is actually the middle point. So I'm going to connect my lines to this component and you see that immediately I'm gonna get many points which are sort in the middle and if I move this slider we move in and out. Right. Uh, now what we said is that we want to move these points up. To generate in turn arches. Do you know how to move a point up? What do you think we should use? So a movement in uh, in grasshopper terms is defined like in many software or in many coding languages by the use of vectors. So what you can imagine that each one of these points is actually a vector. So it's a set of three coordinates, three numbers, and they define a vector. So uh, like an arrow connecting 0, 0, 0 to that point. If you want to move this point in space, you can add to that vector another vector. And this is basically how we move geometries. We use vectors. So if I want to move this point up by 10 units, can you tell me which vector I should add to this point? 0, 0, 10. Is it clear to all of you? Because... I just want to move this point up 10 units in the that direction. So how am I going to do it? I could construct a vector. There are uh, components that allow you to construct a vector. And it's, it's going to be in point. Construct point is the same as construct a vector. But there are also, so in here you see you have vector x, y, d. Which is the same as construct point because the two things are interchangeable. But there are also some predefined vectors, unit x, unit y, unit z. So by default, unit z is 0, 0, 1. If you drag this component into the canvas, and say you want to see what this component does, what the output of this component by default, you can just plug a panel. So you can get a panel from your input this yellow panel and then you can connect this to you can connect your that vector to that panel and you see that the output by default is 0, 0, 1 so a, ve a unified vector pointing up by one unit 
if you want to modify the output value but keep the direction you can just plug a value into here and you see that now I've plugged my height number one into my that vector and now the value of the slider is a value of my vector what I want to do now is I want to take this point and use this vector to move the point up you can imagine that the component to move an object is actually going to be called move and if you want to find it it's not as straightforward but the move component is under transform Euclidean move so this way you can take a geometry, any geometry, it could be also a curve or a surface and you can move it by using a translation vector we have our translation vector in here we have our point which is our geometry we just want to connect the two you will see that we get a set of points which are higher up our original surface so my surface is quite small, so 5.5 is uh, possibly a bit too high. I'm gonna just alter the value of this slider to set the start point a bit lower. And the way I'm gonna do it is by right clicking onto the component and in the minimum here, I'm gonna put uh, 0.5. Okay. So you see I can move all the points. I can label them so I remember that these are my midpoints. So I select the object and I press Ctrl G and I call this midpoints. I can also hide my previous one maybe we can keep them for the moment I might want to hide this one because they are creating a bit of mess so the way to hide them is to select them and then right click on one of them and turn the preview off actually you need to, to click on the canvas and click the preview off if you wanna hide both of them okay so we have our point on the curve which we can still move the position off and we have our point midpoints up so the apex of our arches the next thing I need to do is to generate these arches so I need to find a component that given a start point a middle point and an end point is gonna create an arch I didn't label this before but I can say these are the start points and these are the end points so where is the the, the arch component B well, I guess that I could make is should probably be under the curve label. So I check into the curve label under primitive, maybe. Yes, I have a component which is called arch three points. So I'm gonna bring that into the camera. So it's under curve primitive arch three point. And you see, as an input, it wants start point point on the arch interior, so the midpoint and the end point. So what I need to do now is just to wire my components correctly. So I know these are the start points, so I'm gonna put this in A. These are the midpoints, so I'm gonna put this in B. And these are the end points, so I'm gonna put this in C. And you see that I get some arches right if I want to see 
the surface generated by these arches what I can do is instead of keeping the lines connected to my loft I could just drag A which is containing all the arches coming out from this component into the C and if you just drag this into the component you're gonna disconnect the previous component so you don't need to do disconnect and then connect the new one so I'm just gonna connect this one and you see I got my surface right am I still missing something? what am I missing? so all these arches they all have the same height okay so it's not really nice and it's basically like an extrusion of one curve you might want to do something similar if you're using uh, um, there are some membranes that they need to have uh, um, a regular structure underneath them like ETFE membranes so sometimes you get this sort of bumpy surfaces in our case we want the surface to stretch between high arches and low arches so we need to add the second height and here again we need to do a bit of uh, uh, data man management because we want that the that value is one time the first height and another time is a different height so there is a component which is called repeat data and it's in sets sequence and the way I'm showing this uh, where this component is is by pressing control alt and right clicking on the component this way if you have a component on the canvas and you don't know where that comes from you can just do this control alt and click on the component and you're gonna get these arrows telling you where this component is So this uh, component requires the, the pattern that you want to repeat and how many times you want to repeat this pattern. So before we actually, we can't fit these two height directly into here. We need to merge them into a single cluster, into a single um, stream of data. The way I'm going to merge these two into one component is by using the component which is under tree and it's called merge. So it's in here, you see? Sets, tree, merge. This allows you to get multiple elements and merge them into the same, the same one single output. <laughs> again it's in three sets three merge and you can see if I plug these two into merge you can also always use a panel to see the output of what you're doing you see these two values are now in my list in here a single list and the wire is double which means that the data has changed from single element to a multiple element stream with your no hierarchy. Now this is the data I want to repeat. How many times, how many values do I need in the end? So how many times, this is not asking for how many times to repeat, but how many um, final elements you want by using this pattern. So how many values do I need? number of arts it would, would seem to make sense because I have two heights and I want to assign them to the arches that I have so I have 18 arches I want one which is uh, 1.5 one which is 8 18 times so if I do this if I plug my number of arches into the length of the pattern I should get what I want and we can check you see what I get is the list with the two values and 18 values it says 17 because I start from 0 the first value is number 0 so this is exactly what I want so now 
before I was assigning to that just a single value what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use this list so the double wired list with multiple heights and I'm gonna plug this into that value with that vector and whoa you see and I get very high and very low curves and then of course you can play with that right I didn't say in the maximum I can go back and change the maximum and my surface start to get some now if your surface doesn't look very nice you see some strange artifacts it might be that in order to speed up grasshopper you have the resolution of the surface that you're visualizing the preview a bit low you can increase that of course that's going to slow your definition if it's really big but for this task which is quite small it's fine the way to improve the visualization of your surfaces is to click on this icon in here the blue one and do high quality instead of low quality and you see something which is closer to the final geometry when you bake it yeah. then of course you can play with these values when you are satisfied by your shape what you can do it is you can make it, you can make it usable in Rhino because so far if you select this one you can't get it, you can't move it, you can't alter it in any different way but let's say you like one option what you can do is you can click on your output which I can group and, and label as um, final surface and sometimes it's also a good habit to change the color of the outputs and of the inputs so that they they're really clear which one are the input and which one are the output and a way to change the color of this group is again by right clicking on the group going on into color and you see here you have different color you can pick from you can choose from and for example you can make this red so it's clear that's the output the same you could do with the input you could color them differently from all the other color okay, so when you when somebody or yourself are reading the definition it's clear which one are the input what you can also do sometimes if you have multiple inputs or multiple outputs you can select all of them and again press group so you can keep all of them together and label them as inputs and it seems uh, maybe not very important but as soon as the definition becomes more and more complicated it's very frequent to see people who have developed things which are not really usable because neither them or the people opening the definition can find their way around what, what has been done before so it becomes useless if you have something really complex really complicated and you can't actually make use of it because it's not tidy now as I was saying if you like this surface and you want to actually make it usable in Rhino you need to instantiate this surface into Rhino by baking it. The way you bake it is by selecting the component, right click on it, and click bake. It's asking you to which uh, layer you want to bake that into. We are just a default layer now. So I'm going to say OK. And you see that I have a real surface now in here. But if I want to see it shaded, I need to change the shading preview of this view. From perspective, I go to shaded, and you see that's my surface. If those lines, if you don't like to see the surface edges, what you can do is you can go into 
this label here, display, and you can remove surface edges and surface isocurves. Maybe you can keep the edges, it depends what you want to do. The thing is, what if you have this option that you like, then you want to play with it a bit, and you get another one and you like this as well, but you have lost the previous values. What if you don't want to type all these values somewhere else and then go back and type them again? So there is a way you can actually save a state of all the sliders that are at that moment in the definition and then um, restore them back to that state after you have changed them. So you can save multiple states, which might be different options. The way you do that is by going into solution and clicking to save state. You can call this state as you wish. I'm going to call it option one. Say OK. Then I'm going to move my sliders. I'm going to go again into solution, save state. And I call this option two. So if I want to go back to the previous option, what I need to do is just to go into solution and restore a state, and I can restore my option one state. So all the sliders goes back to my previous state. So you can generate as many stadia roof as you want and you can save all the different options and the power is that if you have two different curves if you're given two completely different curves you can always set one curve set the new curve and set the second one and the geometry will follow and if you change one of these curves if you alter them you can actually see live what are the implications in changing the base curves. Okay. Any question about this first ac exercise? No, the solution I believe is just saving the slider values. So if you are also if you add new sliders it's going to just restore this, the value of the old sliders. If you delete the slider, it's not going to restore that one. So it's just to keep track of the changes, but if you change too much, it's not going to keep track. Any other question on this? OK. So let's move to the next example. So for this example, um, I wanted I, I showed you before the Qatar um, Faculty of Islamic Studies. What we did in there was we had uh, um, an envelope and we developed from the envelope um, a set of trusses in order to define the structure. So what I wanted to do with you tonight um, with this second um, uh, example was to actually define a parametric truss. So how, by, by given a, a few inputs, I can define a truss, but then if I want to change, I don't know, for example, the number of fields of my truss, I can easily and quickly get a different truss. And you will see, if we touch uh, in the next um, lessons about how to import to a structural software, uh, that's quite powerful to be able to change the input quickly and then analyze it, get the result, or visualize the result in Grasshopper, and then possibly change again the, um, the geometry given the ints that I got from the structural analysis. But again, the idea is I always need to understand um, the process behind the generation of uh, my structure, of my design. So the rule that is going to inform uh, the final outcome of my definition. In this case, let's say we want to define um, a simple Pratt truss, okay? Again, the first question I have to ask myself is what are the input the inputs going to be? Uh, 
what do I want to change, what I want to be able to change, and what is the starting point for it. So can you tell me what do you think the starting point for the generation of the trust could be? Yeah? Boundary line possible? Depth? So, so what you said is something that's defining me the extent of this trust. It doesn't need. I don't. I don't need to have both lines because actually, if I have both lines, I'm precluding myself the possibility to increase the depth. I mean, I can. I could calculate the distance between the initial two inputs and alter that distance. But to be honest, I could start with something very, very simple. So the input could be uh, one of the two chords. But to simplify even more, it could be just the two corners, top corners of my truss, and then I generate everything else in Grasshopper. So what I basically need in terms of geometry, for the set out of the geometry, are just two points. Then, as someone from you said, um, what I would need is to define the depth of the truss, so I could define a slider that is defining um, how deep my truss is, and Another important uh, value is how many times I'm going to define my truss, what's the number of fields of my truss, which in theory I could also link to the depth of the truss because you know the, the, the more is closer to a, to a, um, a quad, uh, the better, uh, the more efficient it is. But in general, I want to be able to define how many uh, fields my truss is going to have. And then I need to define a rule for which I'm going to have these diagonals, for, for example. So once I have all my inputs, I need to uh, define, um, define a, a series of steps to get, first of all, my top chord, then my bottom chord, then possible all my vertical elements, and then finally all the bracing, all the diagonals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a new definition, and I'm going to, first of all, write down with panels or with sliders, all this process that I have already defined in my mind or I've sketched in, in some paper. And this is always, and it, it's really, really important. You should always do this before you jump into Grasshopper. You don't have to build your definition on the go, but it needs to be clear to you what the process you're going to follow. So you should save your previous definition if you want, and I save it as uh, exercise um, stadium roof I'm going to save as well this file and then I'm going to open a new Rhino file uh, we can use small object meters you see there are no inputs anymore so if if you want if you want to use this definition in a new file you need to reconnect the inputs but if you open the old definition the inputs are going to be linked uh, i'm going to do i'm going to open a new document and i didn't do it before but it's really important that you save your document even before starting because there is an auto save in the background but if you haven't saved uh, at least once it's not going to work while if you save even just at the beginning, then if the definition crashes, it's likely, I mean, you're likely to get back all your components you have put into the canvas. So first thing you should always do is file, save document, and I'm going to call it exercise parametric trust. Now, I said that we wanted a few inputs, so I'm putting a few nodes. So inputs, I'm going to use a panel to just type, and in here I want the inputs, and I can also list, list them, just for me to remember, to put them all in. And I'm going to say set out points, I'm going to say number of fields, and trust depth. Then I'm going to um, 
the sketch a bit the process. So I'm gonna say my first task is gonna be define the chords. Then I know I want to define verticals. And lastly, define the diagonals. Okay, you can use multiple panels, or I could have actually written them just as a list, and I keep it on one side. But again, it's important that it's clear what I want to do, and I address one of these, and maybe I can delete the panel because I I managed to do that task. Now, the set out points we said. We don't need to define them parametrically, they can be geometry to input from Rhino. So what I need from you to do is, I need you to actually bring two points into Rhino. So if you go into command, single points, or you just type point, I want you to bring two of them in Rhino, to generate two points. And in order to link them to the grasshopper definition, you remember there, is, uh, there are the container components. There is one which is called points. I'm gonna select point, copy it. So I have two of them. I'm gonna call it start point. And I'm gonna call the other one end point. I assume they are going to be the start and the end point of the top chord. So I'm going to right click on one, set one point, reference one point into Grasshopper, I'm going to click into the other one, set one point, and I reference the other point. Right. Now, what I need to do is I need to define the chords. So it seems quite easy because I have the two endpoints of my top chords, so I would just need to connect them. Before I get into that, I want to just write down also the other input. So number of fields is going to be an integer number, so I can say as if you remember, a shortcut is just to um, type the start number, I don't know, at least uh, uh, four fields up to 20. So, four dot dot 20. And I'm gonna call this number fields. And then we set the trust step, it's just a floating point number. I can say, you know, 1.5 dot dot 3 and I call it trust depth. So it seems I checked out all the input that I was thinking to bring into the canvas and to use, I need to, to approach the first task. The first task is to define the chords. So, as I said, the top chords is straightforward. It's just a line between the start and the end point. So the way I can generate is by using the line component we have already seen. So you can just go into curve, primitive, line, you bring your line in, and you connect the two points. And the line that we should get is actually our top chord. So we have just one, we have already one of our outputs defined. Now, can you guess how we're going to generate the bottom chord? What can we do? <coughs> 
uh, we could copy, but you, you remember in uh, in Grasshopper there's no there's not a copy component. There is another component which is move, because in reality a new component is always a copy of a geometry which was there before. So I'm not moving this object. This object is always there. I use the move component and in reality I generate a new geometry. So it's sort of a copy. What I need to do though is to move this geometry, um, I would say in the Z vector, let's say it's a planar truss, uh, and I want to move it down because this is a top chord. So instead of the trust step needs to be multiplied by a negative number, it needs to be a negative amount. So first of all, I'm going to get my vector z, unit z, from vector, vector. <coughs> so the trust depth is 1.5. I could use the mathematical operation and do multiply by minus 1 and get a negative 1, but there is also a, an easy and useful component which is called negative, which is just turning every component into every number into its negative counterpart. So if you go into maths, operators, negative, you bring it into the canvas. So, I have my trust step, I connect it to negative, so it becomes, in this case, minus 1.5, and you can see it if you just move your pointer onto the output. Then I plug into the Z vector, so I have a negative 0, 0, minus 1.5 in my case vector. What I need to do is I need to move this curve down, and if you remember, we saw it before, if you go into transform, uh, Euclidean, there is a move component. So I take my geometry and I move it down. I would expect to see my bottom chord. And in fact, I see it here. And I can increase its depth. Okay, so I'm gonna label it. And I have managed to do my first task, define the chords. Now, how can I define the verticals? This should be pretty easy if I have both chords. Do you have any suggestion? Well, number of fields is the number of segments. I have two chords. I can just use the division component that I seen before, which is actually asking for the number of segments, and divide these two curves. So if you go into curve uh, division uh, divide curve, actually bring two of these, I'm going to connect the number of fields to the number of segments of both components and arrange your components so you get the, the least amount of intersection of wires as possible but it doesn't really matter but it's just for the definition to be more neat and then I'm gonna connect the top chord and the bottom chord this way where I should get are a set of points for my top chords and for my bottom chord. And these are actually the nodes of my truss. So I'm going to label them as well because they are going to play a role in the next part of the definition. So these ones are the top chord nodes. And these ones are the bottom core nodes. 
So in order to create the verticals, you might have guessed it already, like we did before when we subdivided the two curves which were creating the edges of the stadium roof, I just need to connect these points to get the vertical elements. So the way I'm gonna do it is just, I'm gonna go again into curve, primitive, line, and I'm gonna connect the points which comes from this subdivision. And I would see that I have now all my rectangular fields. So this is already an output, so I'm gonna label it as vertical. If you want again, you can change the color of the output. You can also set, once you have defined the color, you can also set the color as default, so the next group will get that color. Now, uh, we have top chord nodes, we have bottom chord nodes. And we connected them in order to get the vertical elements. What we need to define, so this was our second task, are the diagonals, and this is a bit more tricky. It's a bit more tricky because what we need to connect is not the first element of my first set of information or my first list of points with the first element of my second list of points. I need to connect basically the first element with the second element and so on up to the middle and then do the opposite. A trick that I could use and I could think about um, when I start doing this is, I mean, first of all, I'm going to draw all the diagonals in one direction and all the diagonals in the other direction. But still, I need to find a way to connect not the first with the first, which is what by default Grasshopper is doing, but the first with the second and the second with the third and so on. So there is a way to visualize the order these points have within the list they are put in, they are stored in. The way to do that is by making use of a component which is in display vector point list. So if you're going to display vector point list, you drag this component. You see it has this jagged edge which means it's not going to output anything, it's just something for visualization. So if you connect your points to this component, you may see, or if it's really small, you'll need to plug a slider in there, I don't know, at least two. So it's a bit too big for me. This is showing me the order of these points. So you see from 0 to 10, 11 points, 10 subdivisions. And I can do the same, I can copy this component and do it for the second list. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to connect 0 from the first list with 1 in the second list. Uh, by default, Grasshopper is always going to try to connect a 0 with 0. So, the real way I'm going to do that is not by telling, to him, telling him connect the first element of one list to the second of the second list, but I'm going to change the shape of this list so 1 actually becomes 0. The way I'm going to do that is called shift list. So, I'm going to shift this list by 1 and potentially I'm going to discard the initial element so that then when I plug this into the line component I actually connect a zero with a zero. I need to shift this list of points in order to create this connection. So the way I'm going to do it is by using the component which is called shift list and it's actually in sets list shift list if you bring that into the canvas you connect that to 
bottom core nodes and then I'm just visualizing how they look like so I'm using the point count in order to visualize those points you see what happened to my list the first it became 10 and then I've shifted my list 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on up to 9 because by default this shift list component is shifting the list by 1 and it's wrapping the list so it's not discarding the element at the end which I don't fit anymore but it's bringing them back at the beginning in my case I don't want to do any connection with this point when I, when I connect the top chord points to the bottom chord points so I want to set this wrap option to false so if we look again to the shift component what I need to do is I need to put into wrap which by default is true a boolean value which says false the way you do that is by going into parameters you go into input there is a boolean toggle component you bring this boolean toggle into the, com into the canvas it's by default set to false which is what we want and I'm gonna plug that into wrap so what I'm gonna see is that I have the element of the second list shifted by one so I would expect that when I use a line I'm gonna connect them properly in order to create diagonals in one direction I want to do that also for the top in order to do the other thing so to connect the bottom one and get the diagonals in the opposite direction so by cleaning up a bit my definition you can if you want delete this point count I'm gonna label this one this component which are the bottom core nodes shifted I'm just gonna label it as uh, bottom PTS shifted and it's important that you do it so when we do the wiring it's quite clear what we are doing now we revert to a sort of violet <coughs> color I want to do the same for the top core nodes so I'm gonna take this component you can actually copy and paste it but instead of the bottom core nodes we connect the top core nodes and we call this top points shifted now we need to be careful we want to connect with lines the bottom core nodes with the top point shifted and the top core nodes with the bottom point shifted to get the diagonals in one direction and in the other so the way I'm gonna do it is still with the line component I'm gonna go into primitive line and I'm going to connect the components that I just told you so top chord nodes with bottom points or bottom nodes shifted and then I'm gonna do bottom call nodes with top point shifted if I did it right I should expect to see diagonals in both directions which is possibly an acceptable truss but it's not what I wanted exactly there is also another small problem but we will tackle that maybe in the end so the problem is that you might have seen it before when one list is, is shorter than the other what Grasshopper does by default is connecting the last item of uh, sorry the all the item of the longest list to the last item of the shortest list so when when you get to an excess so the, the, the number of the, the bottom core nodes are more than the top core nodes shifted so it's also connecting the last uh, bottom core nodes again 
to the last top core node shifted. So I have an additional an additional vertical in here, which I might want to get rid of. This is a default option when you are matching two lists into um, Grasshopper. By default, this is called longest list. So it's always trying to connect all the points. And one, when one of the two lists is shorter, it's connecting all the points of the longest list to the last point of the shortest. And you see it in this instance. However, before we do that, I want to show you how we can get rid of the uh, output that we don't want. So we don't want all the elements in, in both directions. We want the diagonals only uh, half in one direction and half in the other direction. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to label them as diagonals direction one and diagonals direction two. That. Then what I want to do is I don't want 11 curves, but I want half of them. And to be honest, I will need to divide always into a, uh, no, I think this is correct. It's correct, sorry. Uh, I need, if, if you want the fields to be split equally, you need an even number of fields. So this is correct. They're just 11 because we haven't done what I was telling you. So we haven't removed the last element. So maybe it's worth to do that before, to clean it before we subdivide them into two lists. The way we can override that behavior that I was telling you about of um, Grasshopper trying always to connect uh, the maximum amount of points as possible is by making use of this component which is in list, sets list, and it's called shortest list. So when one of the two lists, um, when the shortest list uh, um, has uh, finished to connect to the longest list, no more connections are created. And I will show you maybe after with a quick example as well. So I need you to bring two of this component, two of this shortest list component into the canvas. Again, they are in sets, list, shortest list. So I need to, you to bring one and two and we need to do a bit of rewiring. So I need to bring the A and B into this A and B. What you can do is actually, if you, if you keep control and shift pressed together, you can take a wire from one position and bring it to a new position without having to find the source again. And then I want you to do A and B. So I'm gonna clean the points which are long i mean that's the time yeah they are the, the points from the shortest from the longest list which are not matching the one in the shortest one so i'm going to do the same with control shift for the set for the other component and i'm wiring that back again into diagonals so when i select this one now i shouldn't see any vertical in excess and in fact i just get my diagonals So this is shortest list. These are your diagonals. So now what we need to do, we have 10 and 10 diagonals. I want to isolate the first five on one end and the last five on the other end. The way to do that is by again manipulating lists, manipulating how the data flow from one component to another and basically breaking that flow. So there is under the sets list um, sets of components, one component which is called split list. So I'm gonna bring this into the canvas and again, I'm gonna bring two of them. And this requires a list that I want to split. And it's gonna be the list, the connection, list, the collection of my diagonals. It's also asking me for the splitting index, so where do I need to break my list? 
So can you think of what this number should be? Alf, so but where, where is this value then? Do, do we have this value in the, in the canvas somewhere? So we have the overall number. What we need to do is we get the overall number and we divide it by two. So that should be the splitting index. So even if we change the number of fields, it should always work. So what we're going to do is we're going to just go into math. We're going to go into the operators. And I'm going to do the division. And I'm just going to divide by a fixed number. I don't want people to, to change it with the slider. So I can use a panel to define that number. Uh, there is a shortcut again to define elements or strings in a panel. If you double click on the canvas and you type quotation mark, you can write a string, you close the quotation mark and whatever you write comes inside the panel. So quotation mark two and then again, again quotation marks is gonna give me a panel with the value two inside. So I connect that there. And then I'm gonna bring this into my index. If you want, you can bring this closer here. Now, if I look at my definition and I select these two components, I see again all my, my diagonals. This is because these two components, they break the stream, but within this component, you have still both in A and in B, all the previous component. So what we need to do in order to isolate the element that we want is actually to select all these diagonals that we had so far and hide them. So I'm gonna do a middle mouse button and I'm gonna click on the disable preview icon. Then I'm going to bring a container just to contain the data that I'm interested in. So I'm going to bring two curves container. These are lines, but lines are curves. And I'm going to select from the first one. Let's see if A is correct. Yeah, it's correct. So we want the Pratt truss. So the diagonals are uh, inclined towards the, the bottom. So their intention. And then I'm going to do the same with the other one. So I don't need the first set, but I need the second set. So I'm going to connect B to my container for the curve. So I'm going to visualize in the end is actually the truss that I wanted. I'm going to back and show you the definition. You can name this one and you can say uh, diagonal output one two. And if you want, you can change the color. If you want, there were also your top chord and your bottom chord, so those were actually outputs. Okay, one last thing you can do if you want to is you can differentiate also the preview of this component into the canvas. So for example, let's say you want to visualize all the diagonals in uh, a different color. So it's, 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 it's easier to read the definition when you look at the output. Um, what you can do is you, you can assign to a geometry uh, a color by a component which is under display, preview, custom preview. This takes a geometry or multiple geometries and a shader and with a shader you can define the color and the transparency of an object. In order to define this shader, there is in parameters, input, 
colors watch and if you right click on the color of this watch you see that you can change define a color and you can also define the transparency the transparency maybe is more useful when you are doing it with the surface so you can see through so if we bring this in here and then we connect the diagonal outputs to geometry by keeping shift press you can actually wire more than one component into the same input if we look at the definition you see that even if they're not selected they are actually green maybe green is a bit confusing because it's same color of one one object is selected i make them blue and you see So custom preview and color swatch. Again, as we were saying before, and we show for the previous example, you can always change one of the input and your definition is gonna adapt. You can change the position of your original points and definition is gonna change. And imagine that instead of one truss, you have to do a hundred of them and you had many start and end points you could input here multiple points and start point multiple points and end points and you will get multiple trusses so what we have seen it was uh, this we saw also in the previous example how you go from a single data streamed from one component to another to multiple data and therefore we see this the, the wire changing we saw how to shift the list so we manipulated the order of the component of the elements within a list and we also saw how to match elements so there is a default way which is called um, shortest list but it's the longest list but it can be altered and it can become for example shortest list is what we have seen so far clear? Again, always remember, it's important that the definition is clear in your mind, then you can define it, and then potentially you can alter it in the past, but in the future, but it needs to be readable. If you don't have a question, I, can sh I wanted to show you, uh, maybe again, just a second, this, uh, what this uh, shortest list and longest list, what does this mean? So you don't have to do it, but just uh, have a look at the screen as just to understand how it works. So I'm just going to open really quickly a new document. As I said, you don't need to do it, but I just want you to understand. So you should just watch what I'm doing. So I have two curves in my document and I'm gonna reference them into Grasshopper. And I'm gonna use the divide component again. So you can call the component by uh, typing, double clicking on the canvas and typing the name, but the beginning is quite good to actually go through the different um, components, list of components up here, so you familiarize yourself with, to, with, with which components you can actually use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide these two curves, but I'm going to give a different number of subdivision for one or the other. Okay, so the first divided by 5, and the second one is divided by... 13 okay so what I was telling you before is when I connect these points so here I have six division points and here I have 14 division points when I do that when I try to match these two lists with this component by default grasshopper is doing what it's called uh, longest list so when one of the two lists finishes all the next element in the second list are connected 
to the last element of the first one. So you get the result that you want usually only if you have the same number of subdivisions. This is the default and it's called longest list by convention because the list is the longest possible. What we have seen before when we were doing our truss and we didn't want additional vertical was to alter this um, behavior, this default behavior, and use the command which is called shortest list. So you connect to this component first your two lists that you want to match and then this component is actually culling all the element which are in excess of the length of the shortest list. There is also a third component which does something similar which is called cross-reference and cross-reference in matching two lists what's actually doing is it's trying to connect all the elements of one list with all the element of the other list. So if I do this and I connect this to my lines you see that no matter how many points all points are connected with all points of one list are connected with all the points of the other list no matter what the length of the two lists is so sh shortest list longest list and cross reference this is important because it's not just lines points with lines but it's like a way to manage um, the data matching of lists, so it could be any data. Okay? I hope it was clear, I hope it was interesting. If you have any question, feel free to ask. If not, you should uh, exercise your skill that you have developed in the past few weeks. You're now probably starting to know enough to actually start playing with it and develop something uh, that I don't know, maybe that you are aiming to, and of course you are always here. We are coming here, and if you are, have started developing something and you want to ask your opinion, our, our opinion, and you want some help, we are always here to ask for your questions, to answer your questions. Sorry. So you are asking. Why in here? Yes. Why not have it before the uh, create the line? The oh, because then you have to split this point and this point, so you will have used four of these components instead of two. So computationally, it's always better to have the least amount of components. You have to remember that in the background, Grasshopper is always streaming the data through this component, and so it's always running. So the least amount, the better. Okay. Is there a way to insert some edge routines of yours? Uh, there, are, there, there are different ways you can manipulate data, and you will see them in the following weeks. And they have to do with trees as well. I mean, because when, when lists start to have a hierarchy, so it's not just a flat list, but they start having data which is clustered into groups. You can pick and choose elements, you can cluster them, connect cal elements, so there are different ways you can manipulate that. And then the next step is you can actually use coding to influence, you can code your own component, so you could embed your own rule. So there are ways you, you have um, coding components, they are in C Sharp, VBScript, and Python, are the most used ones. You can actually code the rule and use that to alter uh, the data match. So,